BBC Four Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. For this collection, Sir Michael Parkinson has selected BBC interviews with influential figures of the 20th century. More programmes on this theme and other BBC Four Collections are available on BBC iPlayer. Lauren Bacall, 50 years ago, though looking at you, it's hard to believe it, you became instantly, with your first screen appearances, a movie star. Appearances in To Have and Have Not and The Big Sleep. And since then, you've had many other major movie parts. You've acted on stage in straight plays and in musicals. And you've published two volumes of autobiography, Lauren Bacall by myself and more recently just out, Lauren Bacall now. Tell me about you now. Do you look back over your life much? No, I don't, but I, I'm afraid I have to correct you on one thing, because now is not an autobiography. It is not a continuation of my, of by myself. It is a book really that concerns more my feelings about life and about work and children and friends and losses and things like that. I don't look back. I don't live in the past. I, the past is automatically part of me, and uh, I am reminded of it from time to time, and I refer to it from time to time, but I don't dwell on it at all. I don't, I mean, there's too much to do now, if you'll pardon the pun. <laughs> there's much too much to do. Um, I would, I would prefer living in the present. I feel that living in the past, you miss the present. What keeps you busy now? Work. I have been very fortunate these last couple of years in particular where I have really worked nonstop, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. I, um, I feel that, uh, I mean, keeping busy and active, curious, interested is essential, and so I feel very fortunate that I've been able to do that. You've always been a worker. You've always been surrounded by people who work. Is work the most important thing in your life? Well, I would say, aside from my children, I would say it is. Uh, and I would say, in actual fact, health would be the most important thing, because without that, there would be no work. Um, but I uh, knock wood. I mean, I hope that uh, I remain healthy for a while. Um, but work is, uh, work is what enables me to kind of look forward to the days and uh, to think of other things and see what I can do with, as far as creativity is concerned in, in acting. Or, and in writing, if I'm not acting, I'm writing. And if I'm not writing, I lecture occasionally or I do something on television or I host something. I, I am not... Uh, a layabout. I'm not anyone who is comfortable doing nothing for too long. The first book, which was autobiography, was called By Myself. Did you mean by that that you'd achieved what you had achieved by yourself, or did it point to a sort of aloneness about you? No, I don't think I achieved it by myself at all. I mean, I don't think, uh, I think it's hard to achieve anything really totally by yourself. No, by myself, the reason I called it that was that I had written the book by myself. Uh, every word. You mean other movies, other stars don't? Well, I think many don't. Yeah. Uh, I did, and I, just because I'm one of these awful people that insists on doing everything herself, you know, I mean, that, and because I live by myself, and I am by myself, and uh, it's a, it was a combination of, of all those things. Is that living by yourself, uh, has that been from an, from an early age a feeling of independence and of self-reliance or of loneliness? I'm not lonely. Uh, 
independence and self-reliance have always played a part in my life. And as I was brought up by my mother, who was a worker, I, she was independent and she taught me to be. And I, in turn, have taught my children to be. Um, so, I mean, I, wa I wanted to be on my own. Uh, I, I, uh, I felt it was, uh, I mean, it's something you all want. You always want to break away, no matter how close you are to your family, you want to break away and, and make your statement about life and decide what you're going to be in your life and make your dreams come true. What lesson would an ambitious young woman reading now uh, your book, what would lesson would you want or expect her to take from it? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. That's a hard one to answer easily because I think the value of honor among friends and character, uh, which would help to define your relationship with your friends and your children, as well as the people you work with. I think that uh, the value that I have placed on friendship and uh, is enormous. And I would think that, I, depending upon how much experience people have had in their lives, I would hope that they would carry that thought with, away with them. And also the value of work, obviously. I mean, work playing the part that it does. Having saved me through many a bad time, uh, I, I remember that after Bogey died, John O'Hara said, wrote me a very long letter and said, you know, your friends may tell you that you should stay away and not work. And he said, believe me, if you start work tomorrow, it will not be too soon. He said, you must do that. And he was right, because you are then forced to think of other things. And, and one must. You have to get on with your life. Those first movies made you a Hollywood star, but you've never thought of yourself, it seems to me, as a Hollywood person. Is that right? I would say in a way that's right, because number one, I was, I was brought up in New York. Um, I am not from the Bronx, as some people have said. I lived in Brooklyn until I was five years old, and then when I was five, moved to Manhattan and stayed there until I went to California. Uh, so I only spent 15 years living in California. And although I had my success in California, I suppose because the success really was not lasting at the pitch that it, it was when I arrived with the first movie. As you know, the first of anything is kind of extraordinary. You know, there's never anything that quite equals it. Um, as a result of that, and the second movie that was released was so bad, and I was so bad in it, that I then had to spend years after that <laughs> just kind of clawing my way back up. I think because of that, I think that had something to do with my not feeling so much a part of the town and the scene. Although I have many, many friends there, and, I, and still have. But I think, the, I think the fact that I left it when I was still young, a young woman, I think that that probably, too, had something to do with it. I feel very much that I belong to a lot of places. You acted uh, not just on the stage, but in live television, taking risks that other <laughs> movie stars don't yeah. take. Why did you do that? Well, I guess I'm a little crazy, but I think also I did it because I think it's one thing to sit in the living room and say, you can do this and you can do that, and, you know, oh, I can do it. You know. But finally, I think you have to find out whether you can. And I think I did it because I just blindly <laughs> jumped in with both feet and just decided that I had to see if I could do it. I also, I mean, I, one of the things I did live was, was uh, Petrified Forest, in which I played a character that was kind of an ingenue. And I, would, I, I was never given an opportunity to play a part like that in film. So I wanted to do that, and it gave me an opportunity to work with Henry Fonda, who I adored. And Bogie, of course, was in it as well, which was also another plus. And the second live thing I did was Blythe Spirit with Noel Coward, who directed it as well as starred in it. 
Now, one does not pass up the opportunity to work with Noel Coward. So I said, OK, I'll do it. Heaven help me. You've got to have the guts to do it, I kept saying to myself. You cannot fall on your face. And I, I was told, funnily enough, David Selznick said, you know, I think you're making a big mistake. If you go wrong, you know, you'll go wrong in front of millions of people. I said, well, I want to find out. I want to see if I can do it. What's the biggest single difference between movie acting and stage acting? Well, the single uh, biggest difference is that stage acting is live and movie acting is not. Uh, you never get a chance to do it again on stage. You, you have to present an entire performance to an audience and they respond to it at that moment so you get an immediate exchange with an audience. In film, you do it for the camera and, uh, of course, the other actors that you are working with. But you don't get to see the finished product until months and months later. So you get no immediate response. When you play the lead role in a long run, for example, in the musical Applause, uh, for nearly two years, how do you keep up being giving a fresh performance night after night after night? You said you didn't get to do it again, but you get to do it over and over and over again. Yes, yes, but I mean, you don't get to retake a scene. Uh, but, uh, well, I mean, in the case of Applause, it was more than two years, actually. I mean, I, was, I played it in New York for a year and a half, and then we were on tour before then for over two months and rehearsed for six weeks before then. I mean, you know, so that was almost a so two-year period. how do you period. keep it fresh? Excuse me? How do you keep it fresh? Well, I, that is the discipline of the theater. You have to keep it fresh. You have to go out there and play it as though you have never done it before. Because the audience has never seen it before. They're entitled to a fresh performance. And so you, you keep that in mind always. And, and that is your discipline. You go out there and this is the first time. And the audiences don't react in the same way anyway. So, I mean, when you get different responses, you, I mean, it affects you. And is the applause you get at the end of a show, I mean, you write about the, the sort of curtain call that was choreographed for you at the end of applause. Is that the oxygen that keeps you going? Well, that isn't what keeps you going, but it's the most exciting moment, God knows. I mean, in applause, that curtain call was... Unlike, I mean, the lift that I got from that was unlike anything I've ever experienced. It was extraordinary. You say that the actor's life in one, perhaps both of the books, is one of rejection. But isn't it, in fact, one of being loved anyway if it works? Well, you're talking about audiences, and I'm talking about producers and directors, and uh, that it is a life of rejection as far as one is always auditioning. Actors... Actors are continually trying to prove themselves because they, directors and producers do not believe that you can do anything that is different from what you have done until after you have done it. And so it's really, it's a claw, you know. They say, well, she can't do that. She can only do this. And whatever you make your hit in, they think that is your category. That is your pigeonhole. That's where you belong. Would you include Howard Hawks in that, who decided what you could do before you'd done it? Well, Howard, Howard decided what he wanted me to do. Howard decided what he wanted me to be. And I was 18 years old when I arrived in L.A., you know. So naturally, I, he could do anything with me because I didn't know anything. And uh, he decided that he wanted me to be this certain kind of personality and character this kind of insolent, you know, give as good as you get kind of woman, although I was a child. And um, he made me into that. He believed in you. Yes, he did. Where were you born? I was actually born in a hospital on 103rd Street in New York. And uh, as I said before, then lived in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn Heights, actually, which is just on a park. And, uh, no, not Brooklyn Heights. It was Lincoln, Par uh, Lincoln Parkway, I believe, or Ocean anyway, whatever it was. It was one of those places. And um, then moved to Manhattan, and then grew up in Manhattan. Who were your parents? My 
father was a man that I didn't know well. He, uh, he, would, he dealt in, uh, I think it was medical instruments. He used to go around and sell, I believe, dental instruments and things. And um, I didn't have anything to do with them. I saw him a few times between the ages of six and eight and never saw him again. My mother was an executive secretary and an extraordinary, wonderful woman, always supportive of me, although no one in my family had ever dreamed of the theater. I mean, I was trained for the theater. That's what I wanted to do. Of course, my grandmother was horrified. <laughs> Why don't you get a real job? Help your mother. <laughs> but my mother believed in me, and she supported me, and she was extraordinary. Was your father's defection an important loss? It must have been. I imagine so. I don't remember affectionate times with him, but I remember that he was my father, after all, and that I am certain that I have been affected by the fact that I felt that I never had a father, and I felt that he didn't care about me. He certainly did not demonstrate that he cared about me. Uh, and I think when you, when you are scarred from childhood, I think you carry that with you in some form or other. I don't think consciously I have, mm. but I certainly think that it has affected my thinking. I mean, the obvious way. suggestion, perhaps too obvious, is that you were looking for a father thereafter. I can assure you, Mr. Bogart, was no father to me. <laughs> you were brought up by your mother and with your grandmother's help. Um, you and must, my uncle, very and your important uncle Charlie. Figure. It must have given you a great sense, nevertheless, of how powerful women could be. Yes, it did. The strength of women, certainly. And the ability to not only run a household, but also to work. Uh, and kind of the aloneness of women, you know. It's, it's interesting, because my grandfather died very young, at a very young age. And my mother was without a husband at a very young age. So they were, these were all women on their own. And so it was, I mean, it was just kind of built in, I guess. And I think that women, I mean, I w it was proven to me that women could do almost anything. Your mother sent you to boarding school. Was, was, were you happy there? My mother sent me to boarding school with the aid of my eight, uncles. Right? With my, the aid of my uncles, who uh, I went uh, because she, first of all, was working all the time and felt that I would have a better education and be out of the city. And she came to visit me every Sunday and wrote letters to me all during the week. And I think I had a love-hate relationship with it, at the, uh, certainly at the beginning. And then I rather enjoyed it uh, because I never, I used to fantasize, of course, always, you know, as I wanted to be an actress, so everything was a play to me or something. And, and then I used to have crushes on my teachers, you know, because I, I missed having a, a sister. I always thought I wanted a sister. So I would either have a best friend that would be like, kind of like a sister or a young teacher who would be kind of like a sister. They thought of you as a nice Jewish girl. Who did? Your family, your mother, <laughs> your mother and your grand. I was. <laughs> I am. <laughs> was the family very Jewish? Well, my mother was not religious at all. My grandmother was. My, you know, the rest of the family were not. Uh, my grandmother was almost orthodox, I would say. I mean, she observed the Friday night burning of the candle, and she observed the not, you know, uh, taking a, a public transportation on a Saturday, and uh, she read a lot. She, she was fluent in eight languages, my grandmother. She was quite an extraordinary woman, quite amazing. But my mother, didn't, it didn't mean anything to her. It didn't mean anything to my uncles. But what did a nice Jewish girl mean? Do nice Jewish girls become actresses? Some of them do. <laughs> when, when did you first want to be an actress? I wanted to be an actress. I think when I was very small, I wanted to be a dancer. And I started to study dancing with a very well-known woman named Ruth St. Dennis who had a school, and I took my first lesson when I was two years old. I wanted to do all of that. I mean, clearly I had a need to express myself. And then I realized that I would not succeed in that area, and I then wanted to be an actress. And I, Where do you think the dream of being an actress came from, or the desire to be an actress came from? 
Well, I think part of it probably was my wanting to play other people, wanting to get outside of myself and be somebody else. And then I had this enormous, enormous crush on Betty Davis, who was my heroine. I wanted to be just like her. I used to cut school to see her movies. And I, um, I think it just came from all of that. And I had this insane imagination. And I just always wanted to be transported. I, w I was a very good mimic. And I, I just enjoyed it. And, and the thought of it, I suppose, was a kind of identification. I mean, I was, it meant a kind of identity for me that I would have as an actress that I did not have. As a 15-year-old, were you confident about your physique? Did you realize you were beautiful? I never have thought I was beautiful, nor do I think so. No, on reflection. I think I look a damn sight better then than I do now, but I don't. No, I have never thought of myself as a beauty. I was never known as a beauty. I have, I mean, beauty, beauties were garbo. She was beautiful, but I don't count myself as being one of those. How did you get to be on the cover of Harper's Bazaar then? Well, that wasn't beauty, really. That was uh, Diana Vreeland, who I was 17 years old after all, and Diana Vreeland had decided that it was time to have a model who looked natural. And she felt that I looked natural, which is why I worked for Harper's at all. I was a rotten model. It was not my forte at all. Uh, and so she put me on the, it was, came at that right time, and she put me on the cover. And that was the big break. Well, that and some of the inside photos, which uh, I was lucky enough to be on a, a couple of pages with actresses. And Diana did a wonderful thing for me, un unbeknownst to me until I saw the magazine, was that the other actresses were named as being actresses, although they were not well-known actresses. And I also, she put my name in, and I was an, ac an actress, she said. So, I mean... Well, Howard Hawks saw the pictures and asked you to go to Hollywood. What do you think he saw in them that made him invite you over? Oh, if only you could ask him. No. <laughs> I think he saw possibilities. <laughs> did you see possibilities when you set off across the continent? Did you realize what it would lead to? I had no idea. See, I never thought of myself as a movie actress. I always thought of myself as being on stage. Name and Lights Theatre, that, that was the only thing I really connected with in my head. But when I got on that train by myself, going to California, what an adventure. I, th I felt like a real grown-up, and I was such a romantic and s with such an imagination. I would carry on conversations with myself and think, this is what it's going to be like, you know. I mean, I lived a fabulous fantasy life. Was it like what you imagined or not? Well, the, the one thing that I remember very clearly was the first time that I ever met Howard Hawks. I had a luncheon was arranged between him and my agent, Charlie Feldman, whom I had not known either, who also ended up owning a piece of my contract. Very hard to represent someone and own them at the same time. Um, and I remember they took me to lunch at the Brown Derby. And this was before my, my screen test. And I remember I was walking with someone, and I forget who it was, but ahead of me walked Howard and Charlie at the slowest pace you can imagine. I thought, if I have to stay out here. You know, in New York, you <laughs> always walk with a purpose. You are always going somewhere. And this languid kind of this... I thought, oh, I can never, I'll never make it here <laughs> if I have to walk like that. That was my first, the first really very clear impression that I remember having. And, and my total terror with Howard Hawks, who was a, a man unlike anyone I had ever met. Extraordinary personality he had. He was very forbidding, this, this uh, very tall, distinguished looking man, always wearing a checked hacking jacket, you know. And he, uh, very close cropped hair, and he would always talk like this, and he would talk, and he would talk to you, and tell you about all kinds of things that had happened to him with, that involved other women, actresses, and how he would tell them 
how to do something and they would say they couldn't do it and then he would show them how they could do it and so that he always won. So I would hang on his every word and I was, I was so terrified of him. He took charge of your makeup and your hair and Everything. your costume? Well, he wanted, you know, he, for years he had tried to find an unknown that he could make into a star and he had never been able to do it. Svengali. Yes, and he did finally succeed, I, I will say, and until, of course, Bogey unfortunately stepped in there and spoiled his plans, but... The voice, you took your voice with you to, do, to California, didn't you? I took my voice with me where? To California. To California, to I did indeed, yes. I mean, I, it is not a manufactured voice. One can hardly manufacture a voice. I did, uh, I did read aloud, uh, so, because Howard, one of his things was, he said, he didn't want what happens to most women when they get excited or angry, their, their voices go up two or three octaves. He wanted mine to stay low, so he wanted me to constantly be aware of keeping my voice down. Which you could do. Which I could do. Had you seen Bogart act before you worked with him? I had seen him in a couple of movies, actually not long before I went over. I saw him in Casablanca, and I didn't, he didn't thrill me at all. Leslie Howard was the actor that thrilled me. Uh, and um, so, I mean, I, I was not too, when, when uh, Howard it was who decided, I want to, I'm going to put you in a movie with either Bogart or Cary Grant. And I thought, ooh, Cary Grant, no, oh, it's not bad, you know, didn't happen. Never worked with Carrie, which what was would infuriating. Have, what would have happened if it had been Carrie? Ah, oh, who knows? Would have been quite a different life, I imagine. I imagine I would have stayed with Hawks. What you did know. you learn from, about acting from working with Bogart? I learned to prepare. I learned to think before the scene started of what I had just been doing, what had just happened, who I had been talking with, what, this, what the situation was that I was in. I learned to do that, not to just, when the director said action, to just start talking with an empty head. Very important lessons to learn. How soon did you know you were in love with him? Oh, you're getting very personal, aren't you? Well, <laughs> it's part of the story of your life. Ah, yes. I don't know. I don't think I knew really for, you know, if you've never been in love, how do you know? I just, I just knew that suddenly it just kind of evolved and it was, of course, a great adventure. It was very dramatic and we were meeting at two in the morning and on street corners. It was very romantic. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, it just kind of happened. It just seemed that he awakened in me, obviously, something that had never been awakened before and something that I really needed. And I needed someone to really care about me. And I guess I needed a man to care about me. And uh, he, was this, he was the most caring man that I've ever known. And, and uh, it just happened that suddenly I just had to be with him all the time. And, I, and, and that turned out to be what it was. And you obviously shared a sense of humor and a way of oh, looking at the world. Very much. Very much so. I mean, uh, humor, you know, one cannot live without it. And I have, I have a very, very good sense of humor. And he had a very, very good sense of humor. And we had a lot of fun. We made each other laugh a lot. And it was, uh, I mean, that's, that's a great, you can't have a better relationship than that. Howard Hawks tried to discourage the relationship. Oh, yes. Oh, he kept saying to me, oh, he'll never marry you, oh, don't, and I would cry, I was in tears most of the time, and he'd say to Bogey, listen, you don't have to marry, why don't you get a little hotel room? That was not Bogey's style at all. So it was, Howard did everything he could to try to stop it, but it was unstoppable. The character you played in To Have and Have Not, this may sound a daft question, but the character's called Slim. And Slim was the name of Howard Hawks' wife, who yes. was a good friend of yours. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. I don't really know. I think he probably did that intentionally. Uh, because Slim was uh, most w wonderful looking and terrific, terrific woman. <clears throat> and she became a friend. 
Uh, of course, she was still married to the boss, so that I could just go, you know, so far and no further. Uh, but I would imagine that was one of the reasons he named me Slim. Jews were powerful people in Hollywood, and Howard oh, Hawks very. was pretty anti-Semitic or resented this and kept he making... He seemed to be, yes. Yeah. He seemed to be. He seemed he, he didn't want Jews in his house, except for Charlie Feldman. Did he know you were Jewish? Not at the beginning. And then finally, of course, he did know. And I was so scared. I was, I was a coward, I must say, about that. I was just frightened. He would say, make remarks, and I would say to Charlie, what is the matter with him? Why does he do that? Why does he talk like that? You know, and Charlie said, oh, don't pay any attention to him. He's all right, you know. And it was strange, you see, because Howard was paid by Jews. You know, he, he was given a platform by Jews by being able to make his movies. But he didn't want them in his house. You married Bogart and started a family. You gave him a family. Were you... That was obviously more important than your career at that time. Yes, it was at that time. I'm, I, uh, I had agreed with him. I made a pact with him that I would always put my marriage first. And I did. I... I I kept to that pact. And I, um, he'd never had children, and I really wanted him to have children. <laughs> I don't know whether he wanted them or not, but he was going to have them. I made up my mind. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he was afraid that it would interfere with our relationship. And, of course, in a way, I suppose it does, because children do take over, don't they? But he was very happy to have them, finally. But I felt my career was... My career meant everything to me, and yet bogey meant more, and I felt that I had to live up to our agreement, and I, I certainly am not sorry I did. He taught you a lot. What's the most important thing he taught you? Well, I think that he taught me that no matter what happens in life, you make up your mind how you're going to live and what road you're going to take in your life. And that you must not allow other people to pull you off that trail, to bring you down to their way of life just because they need company. That you must never lose sight of what your life is. So that was very important. Because in a place like Hollywood, you know, where there is, is a lot of temptation and a lot of different kinds of people. There are people who, who, who don't want you to walk the straight and narrow. They want you to come over to their side. They want you to stay up at three in the morning and be irresponsible and do all, you know. And uh, you mustn't lose sight of, you know, because they, their lives were, were what they were, which had nothing to do with yours. You must not allow them to take over yours. You've got on with your life in a, a remarkably productive way uh, since you lost him. Did you, and you married again, you married Jason Robards, did you nearly marry Frank Sinatra? <laughs> I suppose I nearly would have, which would have been a horrible mistake. I mean, it would never would have worked for either of us. Um, I got on with my life because I had two small children and because that's another thing I was taught by Bogart, you've got to get on with your life. If you lose someone, you cannot mourn them for too long because then you are only indulging yourself. You are not helping the person who is gone or anyone else around you. And um, I've lived many more years without him than I did with him, certainly. Uh, and I, uh, I feel that I've accomplished quite a bit. Uh, I certainly have had a whole career in the theater that I never would have had, and I've written two books, and I have another wonderful child, son, that I love a lot. And Are you close to your children? Yeah, I try to, yes. I travel an awful lot, but I am close to them. Uh, I am close to each of them in different ways. Your grandmother? Do you enjoy being a grandmother? Well, I enjoy it when I see them, but I don't see them very often because I'm always traveling, it seems. I'm on the road. I'm in the air. I'm... <laughs> I don't know where I am half the time, but because I work a lot, you know, so I'm not, I am not your stereotypical grandmother by any stretch of the imagination. I think they think I'm some kind of freak, you know. I'm not, I'm not sure they know really what I am. 
You're always in the air, you're still working. What is it that drives you on? I think I still want to prove something, I suppose. I still want to show that I can do it and that I can do more than people think I can. And I want to use myself. I look forward to work. I'm curious about working with other people. I'm interested in working with other. I love talent and I love to work with new talent. And I'm just interested in doing that and continuing that. I don't want to stop. I, I don't understand people who retire. I've never been able to figure that out. It doesn't make any sense to me. Is there any sort of divide between the Lauren Bacall whom we see and think we know and the real you? Well, I don't know what you really think, you know. I, don't, I, th I think that people that don't know me probably think that I'm very much like the parts that I have played. Although I do believe that since I've written my books, I think the women, women and men as well feel that they know me much better um, and have much more of a sense of, of the kind of woman I am. Uh, and I have, uh, I still get a lot of letters from people who have identified very closely with my experiences in life. And that's very gratifying for me. So, I mean, I am what I am. I'm pretty much up front, you know, I don't lie. I never lie. So what you see is what you get. What are you going to do next? Work. <laughs> next, well, I first of all, I have not stopped for almost two years now, and I really need to stop and kind of collect myself, particularly if I'm going to go ahead and be in this play in Chichester the end of this summer, which I, I hope will work out. I really must clear my head, get myself in shape, stay off airplanes for at least a month or two and uh, in order to prepare for work again. Unless, of course, something comes along before then, in which case I'll have to do it. Do you have fears? What do you most fear? I think ill health I fear more than anything. Uh, I've been around it. I've seen it. <clears throat> in, its, in various forms, and um, I don't look forward to it. How would you like us to remember you when the time, let's hope, decades away comes? <laughs> let's hope decades away. Um, I think just as a woman who... Uh, who dealt with her life in a very positive, healthy fashion and who was productive. If you had to pass on one word of advice oh, to your advice. <laughs> children or your grandchildren or to anybody who asked you, what would you say was the most important thing to remember on the way through life? Well, I think the most important trait to have, which can guide you through your life, is to have character. I think it's tremendously important. That means being honest and honorable and loyal to your friends and family and being responsible for your behavior. I think that that's important. Basic stuff.